um, and then we'll move on to, to the bulk of the session. Okay, so as I said, we're here to, to talk about academic applications. This is the last in the, the three careers webinars that, that we're currently offering to CARA Fellows. And I'm leading this one. Um, I have already introduced myself. I'll, I'll, I'll do it again for those of you who've, who've arrived a wee bit later. My name's Sharon McGuire. I am the PGR Careers Manager at the University of Edinburgh. I have actually been working with research students, PhD students and research staff at Edinburgh for I think about 19 years now. It's a long time and I'm kind of losing track. And we also have Anne Ford, who you heard from in the last webinar. Those of you who are in the last one um, on raising your professional profile, Anne uh, ran that session, and she's a postdoc careers advisor at the University of Cambridge. And Anne is going to be so keep an eye on the chat messages, responding to messages there, but also chipping in at any point if she she wants to or, or feels I'm sort of missing anything that, that she wants to add. So Anne will be sort of helping out with the session today as well. Okay, so um, what we're going to cover, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Actually, what we're going to cover, we're going to talk a bit about how to prepare for academic applications. This is a really, really important part of making an effective application for academic jobs. Um, and uh, I'm sure you already prepare before you write a, a job application, but I want to go through um, a little bit about that because I think it's, it's really important to, to think about um, so you can structure a really good application. And then I'm going to say a little bit about what makes a good CV for any type of CV, but obviously then um, specifically focus on sort of academic CVs and get you um, sort of thinking a little bit about your academic CVs and, and how you might structure them in, in the future. And then we're going to talk a bit about supporting statements, cover letters. They're, they're known as, as various different things. They tend to go alongside a CV when you're making an application. And um, probably worth saying at this stage that a lot of what I'm going to say does apply to the UK context. Okay, this is this is where I work and where I operate. So for those of you who, who are thinking of applying for academic roles in the UK, absolutely what I, I, I say today is going to apply. A lot of what I say is going to apply to any sort of job application wherever you are in the world. There will be slight differences and that's why it's always worth finding out if there are um, certain things expected in other parts of the world, whether you're applying in North America or somewhere in Asia or somewhere in Europe. Um, there may be slight differences, but a lot of the, the sort of basics of academic applications are going to be the same across the world, uh, certainly in, in terms of the emphasis I'm, I'm going Okay, so I just wanted to start by getting a sense from you all as to what you're going to be applying for. And this will take me a minute just to set up because um, unfortunately our system doesn't allow us to uh, to do this in a very nice way. Um, but um, the you all, some of you may be ready to apply for for uh, jobs quite soon, and others um, will be uh, planning ahead. But I'd like to get a sense of you know what what um, it is you're maybe thinking of at this stage whether it's immediate applications or something that's um that's, that's in the future what stage are you at because i know that you know i may be speaking to people who are in the middle of doing a phd some who are, who are obviously much further forward in the career having had lots of sort of teaching literature experience already so that's great i'm getting a bit of an idea of uh, who we've got okay so we've got a bit of a mix here of uh, people applying for research only and lecturer roles okay we were 50 50 yeah it's looking um okay i don't know whether some of you aren't able to see the poll that comes up on this screen because there's quite a few people it could just be that you're you're undecided at this stage and that's absolutely fine i just uh, quite nice to see whether I, I need to be um sort of structuring this this talk in a particular way but it looks like we're, we're fairly sort of 50 50 between the research only and the lecturer role which is obviously that mix of teaching and research um, and a few people do feel free if there's something that's not on there and um, do feel free to let us know in the chat box what is your thinking of applying for obviously this is a session on academic applications so if you're interested in applying for jobs outside the academic environment and I'm not going to cover anything in this session but if that is what you're interested in then do let us know because it might be that that we consider putting on um, additional sessions in the future for anybody who's interested in that okay thanks very much uh, but as I say uh, it looks like we've got a balance between uh, research and lecturing so I'll, I'll move on now Okay, so um, again, those of you who've already made a number of academic sort of applications throughout your career, those of you who are, who are further forward in the career will, will know that this is, is pretty common. Academic recruiters pretty much always ask for an academic CV. 
In the UK, certainly, you know, we may use online application processes, but they're asking you to upload a CV. OK, and that CV is obviously very particular to the academic environment, so it looks quite different to other types of CVs. And then, as I said, they use quite different terminology. They might be asked for a cover letter or supporting statement or personal statement. These all effectively cover the same types of things. I'm going to say a lot more about, about that at the end, but they may use slightly different terminology. But it's a document that goes alongside your CV and highlights additional experience or, or highlights specific experience that you've mentioned in your CV, but you want to, to make more of, um, but also maybe talks a bit about your motivations uh, for, for a job, which you don't do in a CV. They may also ask for very specific sort of statements or information, a bit more detail about your research ideas or a bit more detail about your teaching approach and, uh, you know, in, the, in a teaching portfolio. Again, they will add different things, but the standards are, are the top to academic CV with some sort of supporting uh, document. OK, I'm just going to start by, by going through a couple of slides, which, which are just good practice, whatever CV you're putting together. OK, um, so this is not specific to academic CVs, but it does apply to academic CVs. So the first thing is that every time you apply for a new job, your CV should be targeted to that job and that employer. I think um, a lot of people and uh, I don't know what your take on this is, but I think a lot of people um, maybe think that the CV can stay the same and your cover letter or supporting statement is the one that you target to the job you're applying for. But you're likely to make a much more effective application if you adapt your CV for every application as well. And I'll talk more about why that is. You're not going to be making massive changes to your CV every time, especially if you're applying for similar types of job. But you will be making small tweaks. So your experience doesn't change. You know, your education and your, your work history don't change, your publications don't change. But how you present them in your CV may change to make sure it's, you know, um, most effective for the, the job you're applying for. So you only want to highlight what's relevant in terms of your experience and skills and achievement and again academic cvs we'll talk in a minute about sort of length of academic cvs but academic cvs traditionally have you know can be quite long but you don't necessarily need to talk about everything you have ever done and it's really thinking about the person who's reading your cv the sort of attention they have and making sure you're really highlighting what's most relevant while the person is engaged with your CV and not um, expect them to read about things maybe that were done a long time ago that are maybe not entirely or not directly relevant to the job. So again, that, that ties into the space and importance of the most relevant material. So you shouldn't be hiding really important um, experience or, a, you know, um, a, yeah, experience or education on the last page of a CV or at the bottom of a CV. You need to think about what you want to put up front on the top couple of pages, top half of the first couple of pages, because again, when somebody's reading through a CV quite quickly, they're going to want to, to see your main experience first. The third point, space and importance. Sorry. Um, so more detail for the third point in terms of space and importance of most relevant material. I'm going to talk about what is most relevant material in a, a little while, but I think it's about you know, but if you think about yourself reading somebody else's CV, then really you're paying a lot of attention on the first page, certainly the top half of the first page. You, you turn over to the second page. Again, the top half of the second page has you has your attention as you move on through the CV. Your attention wanes because you've been looking at it for, for you know, a, a reasonable amount of time. So you're thinking about what you want them to read first. What's the most important thing that you've got to offer for the specific job you're applying for? And that needs to go quite high up in the CV. I mean, I think, you know, they'll also scan for specific section headings on the CV. So if your publications are towards the end, but clearly labelled, then again, that's not necessarily a problem. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk in a bit more detail about sort of changing the description of your previous work to meet the job requirements. But yeah, that's absolutely the case. You may well just be tweaking slightly how you describe what you've done, but you will be changing how you describe what you've done to make it fit as well as possible the job you're applying for. So everything in each section, you'll have, you'll have different section headings in your CV and then under each heading, everything will be presented in reverse chronological order. And by that, I mean your most recent experience first. OK, so, um, you, you know, you will have this is standard practice in the UK. You know, your so your fellowship at the moment, that will be what you see top um, of a, an employment. If, if you're um, an 
employed fellow or if you're a PhD student, that will be at the top of that section. Um, and then it will go back to, to the previous employment, working all the sort of way back to, to, to how much you want to, to let them know. So reverse chronological order is what employers are used to seeing and is standard practice. And that last point I've put up, making it interesting and easy to read and absorb. That's very easy to see, to say, not so easy to think about how you do that. But I think that's a little bit to do with layout and language that you use in a CV. Again, put yourself in the position of the academic recruiter. Think about um, how, you know, if you're given a, a, de a page of A4 that is dense text, how hard it is to read that compared to maybe um, something that's, that's a, a page of A4 that's uh, split up with nice section headings, maybe with uh, short, snappy sentences and bullet points. So really thinking um, about how you make it easy to, to read. Um, OK, I'll, I'll let, maybe let Anne pick up that, that sort of question that's up there at the moment, uh, but we, we will be coming back to that. So um, clearly out on a CV. So obviously what you've done and the, the, the experience and the education you're talking about is the most important thing on a CV. But you can actually hide really good experience by presenting it in a way that isn't easy to, to read on a CV. So having a very clear layout, nothing fancy, just sort of, you know, your, your sort of straight, but nice sort of bold headings. Um, uh, not, as I say, big, huge paragraph chunks of, of, of uh, writing in paragraphs. That makes it much easier to read if you avoid that. Um, so visually appealing, again, it's just nice, clear, clear formatting, not lots of different sort of different sort of headings and different sort of underlining, but just keeping it consistent and easy just makes it easier to read. And I'm going to talk about positive language um, in a little bit more detail later on. And it is using um, sort of quite active words to show that you have achieved and that you have made an impact in your um, research or teaching so far. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I want to appropriate length. What's the appropriate length for a CV or for an academic CV in particular? Do feel free to pop into the chat what you think um, appropriate length is for an academic CV. How long do you think it should be? How many pages of A4? OK, got eight, we've got two, higher, lower, maximum of three, two, two to three pages. OK, a variety of, of, of different uh, numbers there. So um, for industry CVs, for CVs out with the academic environment, two is standard. You really shouldn't go much more than two. Even if you have a lot of experience, you should be able to present what you want on, on two pages. Academic CVs have traditionally been longer than that. However, um, you know, you're, you're all sort of in, I suppose, a reasonable ballpark in terms of two, three, four sort of pages. Um, I have seen academic CVs, not too many of them, but I do remember one that was 36 pages long. And nobody has the attention span to read through 36 pages of an academic CV. It could be that you create what you call your monster CV, where you co collect all of your information, you put it all in one large document, and then you choose from that every time you make an application. But then you create an academic CV that is, you know, much fewer, much fewer pages. It isn't. I've asked the question. There isn't an absolute answer. Um, two, three, four, I think is reasonable. Um, yeah, um, Europass CV is, is absolutely not a good uh, template in uh, in the UK. Um, so I would avoid using templates. I would have a look at different examples of CVs and see what you like and what might work for you. Uh, but I'd be interested to see how and what, what you think about the sort of Europass. Um, it's, it's maybe different in, in other parts of Europe, but the UK, I think it, it doesn't work particularly well here. Um, so, yeah. Um, a short CV, getting across your most important um, experience for the job you're applying for in a shorter space as possible is what you're looking for. Now, that doesn't mean say cramming everything into one page, but keeping it fairly short is absolutely what you should be going for. And obviously, a CV should never go out on its own for an academic job. You should always be accompanying it with a cover letter, a sporting statement, um, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail. OK, but before you... Um, even you see a job that's being advertised, an academic job, whether that's for a research assistant, research fellow, or a lecturer, which seems to be what most of you are are, are looking at, then obviously before you sort of create your your cover letter, sporting statement, your CV, um, you'll do some preparation. 
what sort of preparation do you do? You see a job vacancy for, for an academic job you're interested in, what do you do? So this is this is a, an opportunity for you to, to play around with the whiteboard here. So if you have a, a look, as I say, above the slide, you'll see there is the option to click on a T, T symbol. If you click on that T, you'll find you can hopefully uh, type directly onto this slide. I did give you permissions to use it. I know there's been problems with it in the past. So, so let me, so, so do feel free to give that a go and see whether you can type directly onto the screen and let me know what sort of preparation you, you do before you, you start writing your academic job applications. Do you read anything? Do you talk to anyone? Do you, you know, if you read anything, what do you read? What sort of things do you do? You do? If there are any problems using the, uh, the tools, then do feel free to pop it into the, the chat box, hopefully. Hopefully you, you'll be able to use it though. Yeah, okay, so obviously in your, your application you want to highlight their expectations that fit your CV. But what, yeah, oh great, the, 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 uh, the whiteboard is working. Okay, so um, what we've got is, uh, I'll just move that around a little bit because it goes on top. So we've got people saying, yeah, read the job advertisement and the job spec. Absolutely. Really, really important that you do that and you do it sort of carefully. Sorry, I hope I've not just ruined that one. Ah, here we go. Sorry, I'm, I'm moving these around, which is why I'm making a bit of a mess. Sorry, I've made that really big. I don't quite know why that's happened. <laughs> uh, contact the PI in advance. Yeah, that could be a really good thing to do. Um, you know, about hosting the institution main vision. Yeah, really good. Yeah, thinking about what type of institution is it? Yeah, how do you find out what institution it is? I'm really sorry about that long one. It seems to have gone a little bit mad. Um, find out about the university and the staff. Yeah, I'm sorry. I can't seem to, <laughs> to get that to change again. And I apologize to the person who took the time to, to read that. Okay, so you're reading the vacancy details and searching for the department line management yet yeah, their research interests and their previous projects to speak to people about those yep yeah, that is a great great point sorry i i, I messed it up and um, so yeah you're looking for some specifications and um, thinking about um looking at the requirements of the job all of this is really sort of good um, information, good preparation to do, and absolutely the sort of thing that you should be doing. Anything else before I move on to the next slide? Is there anything else people want to, to say about the sort of preparation they do? I'll just give you a minute just in case. Yeah, job description, really important. Um, and, and really looking at the detail of the, the job description and the person specification. Okay, we'll move on. I mean, I think you've you've covered a lot of the um, the main points here, but here's um, just me sort of, you know, I suppose picking up on some of the things you said. So you absolutely need to do your research on the university and the department, and then think about the contribution you can make to the type of university, the type of department, and the type of role that they're advertising. Um, now, the type of um, preparation you do will be dependent on the type of job role you're applying for. So. Looking at things like mission statements and teaching strategies, obviously that's the mission statements probably worth having a look at. But if you're applying for a sort of entry level role after doing a PhD, if you're applying for a postdoctoral role or research assistant, it's probably not as important. Certainly not as important to look at their teaching strategies, probably not um, really important to, to understand the mission statements in too much detail. But if you're applying for a lecturer role, then these are absolutely things you should be looking at. So. What is important to the university? You know, are they talking about their main thing being we, we you know, we're really proud of the, the fact that we have great industry links which help their, their students? Or are they focused on their research excellence? Or are they focused on the quality of their teaching or widening access or their online provision? You know, you can learn a lot from having a sort of quick look at the university websites, having a look at their mission statements and their teaching and research strategies. So certainly if you're applying for anything at lecturer level or above, you should know an awful lot about the type of university they are. If you're applying for a research role, 
then you're looking at obviously um, the researchers in the department. You're certainly looking at the principal investigator, the person who's going to be your line manager. Who are they? But who else is in the department? Who else would be working with? What sort of research areas do they work on? You know, maybe having a scan at some of their pub publications and really thinking about where you can make a contribution um, and how you might be able to collaborate with some of the people in that department. Now that's again especially true if you're applying for a lecturer role where you'll be developing your own research area. You want to think about how you'll fit with the research that's already happening in that department and maybe who might be a, a sort of good collaborator. And that could be in your department that you're applying for, but also more widely across the university because obviously there's a lot of interdisciplinary research happening now. Teaching again, you're having a look if you're applying for a, a role that, that's, that teaching, uh, where teaching is involved, whether it's lecture or teaching only, you're, kind, you're going to be looking at what courses they already teach and which ones you think you could teach on. Uh, but also maybe think about any gaps, certainly for lecturer roles, maybe not for so much for teaching fellow, but for lecturer roles, you'd be thinking about, okay, what are their gaps in the provision? Do you have expertise in certain areas that they don't currently offer courses on? You know, would you be able to develop a, a a module that you know that, that might be interesting so you're having a good look at you know the sort of teaching they already do and you're doing, doing this by looking at their website by reading the job description and by talking to people who maybe already work there or who the, the, the contacts you're given in the, the job description so doing a lot of preparation the slides are, are taking a long time to move on Try again um, okay, so I said already that you should be targeting your, targeting your CV for each application. So you're thinking about the type of role you're applying for. Is it teaching only, research only, or lecturing, which is a combination of both? Does it have clinical responsibilities, any sort of industrials or consultancy, anything different? You're thinking about the type of organisation. You know, does university strategy put an emphasis on teaching and the student experience or more on research? And what does it tell you about what's important to them? And then you're, as you've all considering the job description and person specification really carefully to help you target your application. Um, OK, I'm going to pick up one of the questions there. Um, I'm going to sort of leave the publications a little bit later on. I might pick that up, but we will come back to it. Um, would you suggest developing a module if a gap is detected, even if it was not noted on the job specification? Um, yes, that is OK to highlight that. If you're applying for a lecturer role, they expect you to come in and make that sort of contribution. Again, you'll be looking at the job description. You'll be looking at how they describe what they want you to do. And if it is very much about designing and developing courses, then it's very appropriate to talk about um, your areas of expertise and what you could do. Not so much to say you should really be doing this and you're not already, but just say, I, you know, I would have, you know, would be able to, to offer this if um, it was thought sort of useful to the department. And that would be more a sort of cover letter supporting statement type uh, thing to talk about. So we'll come back to that in a little minute. OK, I just want to point out here again, just to continue, you know, finish off sort of making this point that not all lecturer jobs are the same, just like not, not all sort of research jobs are the same. And these were two jobs just at the start of the week that I um, sort of you know looked at on, on jobs.ac.uk, where a lot of our um, academic jobs in the UK are advertised. One was a lecturer in geology at University of Hull. And it says it's a teaching focus, focus that the first bullet point there was a quote, although this is a teaching focus post, Post all that could join and attend activities in appropriate research group, but there was no mention of research experience asked for in the job description. And that is in contrast to the other lecturer job that I've put up there in mechanical engineering at Sheffield Hallam, where they're saying you'd be expected to develop, manage and deliver research and teaching at the highest level. And the top two things that are mentioned in the job description are about research. Publications or papers and then maybe sort of a academic project work research is in there as well so these are very different lecturer roles so you'll be creating quite different cvs depending on which one you're applying for okay so again another i think this is our, our kind of last whiteboard so don't worry that we're, we're whiteboarding to death that um think about the academic cv then what would you always put in an academic cv what do you think is the most important that you will always be mentioning academic cv and what things do you would you maybe say well I'm in depending on the job so if you want to take a minute again to just write on the whiteboard there and say what would you put um and if you can try to sort of keep them either on always or possibly then please um you know these are just sort of, you know overall is it publications is it funding um yeah skills and your area so that's probably technical research skills and publications yeah most likely 
you'd be very few um, academic jobs you wouldn't be putting um, publications. Education and previous relevant work experience, absolutely, there was always going an academic CV. Again, maybe not everything about your education and not everything about your work experience, but again, onto that as well. The latest qualifications, again, yeah. Public engagement, is that, a, is that does that cross the boundary? Is that an always or possibly? Again, it will depend on the type of job, but I would think public, public engagement would most often be something that would be really valued highly, so it should probably be there. Um, and possibly the skills, you might not specifically mention them, as you say, but they hopefully will come across in your, your academic CV. So you might not absolutely um, outline on an academic CV. Awards, we'll talk about awards in a minute. Um, yeah, I think that is a possibility. It depends on the type of awards. Employment history, absolutely, but not necessarily all of your employment history. You'll definitely talk about funds secured. You'll definitely talk about conference organisation. Those would be definites. Again, it's about where you put it on the CV and how you, how you order it. So, uh, so yeah, lots of things um, coming on the, the always. I'd always put there, but again, it's how much you say about them and uh, how much detail and where you place them on the CV that's going to change depending on the job you're applying for. Okay, training. Yeah, does that mean training you've undertaken? I would, I would agree that that's a possibly. Um, I think, again, when employers are, are looking at a, a CV, they, they probably usually value sort of actually experience more highly than having done a course in something. I think maybe it's different if we're talking about, you know, training that leads to qualification to that nice your ability to teach in higher education. That, that you know, if you're applying for a teaching job, that'd be an always. But again, training, yeah, that, that would sit with us or possibly for, for me as well. OK, I'm going to just conscious of, of time. Important workshops held by good universities. So does that mean workshops you've delivered or workshop or workshop you've contributed to? If that's the case, then yeah, anything that shows your your ability to disseminate your research, your ability to um, uh, sort of communicate about your research is important. It's your research interest, yeah, that might not go in the CV, um, but it would certainly what well, most always go on a cover letter if you're applying for a job where research is part of that and if you're applying for a job where they're not just expecting you to come in and do research that's already been set out I think if you apply, if you talk about future research interests when you're applying for a, a postdoc which is about going in and, and you know, helping somebody conduct their own research then they may be worried that you'll be focused on on the research they're asking you to do so I think that be be careful keywords yeah that might not that might not go there Peer review activities, yeah, I mean, I think that's probably quite important for most academic CVs. So I, I consider that might go um, on the left-hand side and always. Uh, but again, there's always, with all of this, there's, there's mostly it depends. It depends on the job you're applying for. Okay, that's great. Thanks. I'm going to sort of move on and pick up on this now. Um, and this is a, a very sort of broad overview and will be very familiar to you all i'm sure about the sorts of things that you you know, would be including on an academic cv and some of what you you've picked up on the previous slide so you'll certainly again think about what sort of headings you might use in your cv you may have use headings called such as research experience and teaching experience and um, maybe clinic experience if that's relevant to your subject area you may have headings at conference presentations or publications, funding awarded, these types of things, maybe headings you'd use. But the key information on the right hand side, those are not headings you'd, you'd use, but that's the type of thing you're trying to get across. And all of that you picked up in the last slide. There's nothing there that I don't think you, you mentioned. But what you are doing, which I know I've said several times, but I'm going to keep saying, is you're choosing the most important headings and the most important information, depending on the job and the order you're putting them in the CV is what's most appropriate for the job as well. So with if you choose to use headings such as research experience and teaching experience, if it's a teaching focused job, the obvious thing is to put teaching experience first, followed by research experience. If it's a research focused job, the other way around. I mean, that seems fairly straightforward, doesn't it? Sometimes you've done jobs where it's a mix of both, so it might be hard and you may choose to just use an employment history where you bring it all to um, section heading, where you bring it all together. But again, hopefully that you know, quite simply gives you an idea of how you might be subtly changing your CV for different applications. Okay, trying to, to move the slides. Oh, yeah, okay, so hopefully it's not going to click through again. Um, so these are the basics. Uh, I did click through again. Um, it's a wee bit slow 
think my internet. So um, personal details obviously need to be on your CV, but certainly in the UK, um, all you're looking for is your name and contact details. Um, so it could be your departmental address at the moment, could be your email address, could be your work phone number. Email address is usually sort of enough, but you don't usually need any further detail. In other parts of the world, it is standard maybe to, to say a little bit about your, um, maybe to give a date of birth, maybe to give a um, nationality. None of these things are, are necessary in the UK. It's just your personal details or just your contact details. Education. I'm, not going to say much more about but i think you know we, we did put that under the sort of essential um criteria and it is it's essential in an academic cv and you certainly will have an education section in your academic cv but it's usually only going to cover your higher education now those of you who've you know got you know 10 15 years work experience i'm sure you dropped off um, a lot of um, school-based qualifications and possibly even first degree qualifications a long time ago those of you who, who may be still doing a phd might still have some school-based uh, work um, qualifications in there but if you're applying for an academic job it's very likely that you'll just be talking about your phd possibly a master's um and maybe a first degree depending on how far on you are in a career um and you know, you might include some information on the subjects you studied, research methods, name for your PhD supervisor, if that's quite re recent, and explain foreign qualifications. I mean, a PhD is a PhD. People understand what that means. But if there's anything about the qualifications you're putting on your CV that you think won't be understandable to the person who's reading them, then just an explanation. So if, if you know, the terminology is slightly different between undergraduate degrees, then just put up sort of in brackets equivalent to a UK undergraduate degree or something about that. I've put up their online profile. And again, this is entirely your choice, whether you know a number of academics do put some type of online profile next to their personal details at the top of the CV, and Twitter account could be up there. So it's whatever you think will um, allow the recruiter to see more about you uh, that, they, that you'd like them to see. So if you've got you know, a full list of publications on your academia.edu or research, uh, gate or the, your research page on your, your website. If you've got your full list of public there and you don't want to put them all in your CV, then you give them a link to that. If you're very active in Twitter and the focus is about your research and teaching, then absolutely, why not put that at the top of your CV? It is your choice. You do not need to give them a link to any type of online profile on your, on your uh, academic CV. If it says something positive about you and you're comfortable giving them the link, then yeah, absolutely put that in there. I'm going to say more about employment in the next slides. Referees. Let me just pick up on that. Um, yeah, I think that's really important, Anne. It's, it, the Twitter account has to enhance your reputation. So if it's something you use for personal use um, uh, as well as work use, then, then maybe not. Um, yes, uh, and good point. You picked up the referees here as well. Um, it is standard practice to include your, your referees on uh, your academic CV. And you should choose those um, references carefully. You want them to be people, people who will talk very positively about you and what you've done and your experience. You should, when you give them the, the name and contact details of your referee or CV, you should say what sort of relationship they were to you. So were they your PhD supervisor? Are they your current employer or PI? Um, were they a, um, a colleague? Um, you know, just give them an indication of who that person is. And do make sure the person, the people that you're putting as your references on your uh, CV know what you're applying for. So I would always be sending them an updated copy of your CV or as close to an updated copy of your CV. If you're applying for lots of jobs at once, I would, I would probably send maybe one that's, that's you know, fairly, fairly close to, to what you'd want them to, to see about you because they're not necessarily always going to know about your most recent experience or they're not always going to um, think about um, you and the way you you'll be presenting yourself and your CV. Okay, I'm aware what we're, um, this is taking quite a long time, so I, I will move through. Um, so employment, again, it's about section headings, choosing what's going to work for your application. You can just have the one section head that says, section that says employment history and just have reverse your um, re recent jobs under reverse chronology um, under there, or you can choose specific headings, which you've already mentioned. Don't just outline what your responsibilities were for employment. Focus on what you actually achieved, on the results you achieved. And I'll give one brief example in a minute. And as I said before, rather than having a, a, a huge paragraph of text describing what you've done, consider using maybe bullet points with short phrases. Um, and I talked before about the language before. Using language like achieved, created, initiative, that initiated, that 
it's quite active, quite uh, positive language. So think about those active words um, that may really sort of demonstrate that you have made you know, positive contributions. And for those of you who are fairly early on in your career, then it could be that part time or voluntary work is appropriate. You know, certainly if you were tutoring part time during your PhD and that's where your, your main teaching experiences has been gained, then that's absolutely fine. And um, the other things, you know, public engagement, voluntary work that you want to put on there as well, if that's relevant to the role. So, so don't dismiss part time or voluntary work uh, if that really adds to your application. OK, so um, if we're thinking about the sorts of thing, if you're talking about research, if you're applying for a job where you know, research is something that's, that, that they're looking for, then these are the, the types of things that you'll be picking up on. Um, so either you'll be focusing both on your achievements, so what you've already done in research, but you might also be giving information about your potential. Um, so you'll be talking about details of your, your research topics and maybe your research skills. If you're applying for a te very technical job, then outlining your, your technical research skills are important. You'll obviously be talking about any uh, presentations you've given, um, maybe exhibitions, displays, if, you, if any of you are in the arts sector. Uh, you'll be talking about publications and you can absolutely talk about uh, those that have always been published as well as those that have been submitted in preparation potentially and obviously you could group them into different types such as peer-reviewed journals or books or review articles depending on what counts most in your field because in subject different subject areas and um, different so in, in the arts and humanities the, the monograph the book is what counts most in science and engineering it tends to be um, the peer-reviewed journal articles you might be talking about collaborations or networks you've developed maybe research visits there's so a whole host of things up there that you may be picking up on. And again, you're choosing between these. You're not necessarily covering all of these. You're thinking about the job you're applying for and you're going, which ones have I got experience in and which ones do I want to talk about? And if you're applying for a lecturer post, everything you're talking about is going to be pointing to your potential to grow your research and attract funds because that's important for lecturers in the UK. If you're applying for a postdoc role, you're pointing to research experience that that's going to indicate that you have the technical and other skills needed to conduct the research. Not so much important, unless it says this in the job description, not so important for you to demonstrate that you are able to attract funds because that's not necessarily something you'll be required to do if you're uh, applying for a postdoctoral research bill. So here's a very sort of a short extract from, from one part of a, an academic CV. These are all from the VTI website, which I'm going to mention at the end, um, which has a whole um, section of, of, of different types of CVs um, of varying quality, I might say. Um, but here's a, a, an extract from somebody talking about the research experience. Okay, Put yourself in the position um, of somebody reading through a CV quite quickly uh, for a, a research job. What do you think, what do you like about this and, and what do you think doesn't work? Do feel free to pop any comments into the, the chat box. Um, I'll not take long over this because we, we seem to be whizzing through the hour quite quickly. So is there anything about this you think you like the way? It's, it's obviously just a short extract from, um, from, from re somebody, a research experience a part of an academic CV. What do you like? What do you think works well? And what do you think they, maybe doesn't work so well? Do, OK, so a couple of questions, I think, coming up. we will come up to this, you know, if and I realize Anne, you're, you're picking up on loads of questions and thank you very much for that. If there are things that we don't manage to, to get to throughout, then um, then please, um, we will we will come back to them at the end. I can scroll back through the, the messages if you've got a little bit of time at the end. Um, OK, so a number of questions coming in, no, no particular sort of comments on, on this. I would say, you know, Highlighting selective achievements is quite good for different roles. So I think this works quite well. Um, the first sort of paragraph is quite dense, quite difficult uh, to read through um, some, of, um, some of the text there. So you might think about breaking it down into shorter sentences just to make it easy to skim through. But the fact that they, they've highlighted um, their achievements in that role, I think, is really positive. So I think it's, it's quite nice to think about sort of doing that, really focusing the mind of the person who's reading your your CV. Again, here's another one, uh, just obviously from the funding awards, just to show, and this is quite an old CV, so the dates are, 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 are quite out of date, but you'll see that somebody here has listed all of the funding and awards they've achieved. Now, this is somebody fairly early on in their career, 
but they've said what they what fund who's get awarded them funded funding what for and how much it was and that's quite nice to put in even when you're early on in the career and in, in career maybe got a couple of hundred pounds or you know whatever currency to um, attend a conference for a travel grant it's good to show your ability to convince people to fund you for whatever reason okay that you can persuade that you can write a good application for funding so this is just a, a bit of an example um, of somebody who has detailed their funding and awards and that's fairly standard in academic CV, quite nice to see. Okay. Again, the next one I've um, pulled out just a section on presentations. So this will be conference presentations. Um, and again, you can see that they've divided up into different types of presentations. If you're invited to pre present at a conference, that shows um, that your uh, research or what you've been asked to talk about has been recognized and noticed. So any invited presentations you've done, it's nice to highlight those as they've, as they've done there. Again, giving an oral presentation, depending on the conference, and this really depends on the conference, uh, can sometimes be seen as more positive than, than, than posters because it tends to be the case that selected only a selected number invited to give oral presentations. So you can again, sort of highlight what's most important by giving little subheadings for each section. And I would say this is similar for your, your uh, publications. Using subheadings for your publications can work well as well. And these subheadings might be things you've already published, things that you've submitted, things that are under review. Again, showing that you've got research publications coming out that might not already be published is something that's, that's worth doing. OK, when we're looking at teaching, um, yeah, I mean, being invited is is different than just presenting it. It tends to be that that um, the the conference organisers have proactively got in touch with you, or okay, if it's a conference, or um, or if you a, a department is organising a seminar series of a university, and they have got in touch with you to come and give a a, a a lecture or a presentation. So there are sort of differences there. I think it's very common for 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 many many sort of. Um, academic staff to 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 you know present at conferences and not necessarily have a lot of invited presentations so don't worry if, if or invite worry if, if that's not something you you be invited to do because still having gone and presented is still very positive okay so um, in terms of teaching again you're providing details of the teaching you already have and I know certainly with the, the groups that we've been speaking to over the last couple of um, couple of um, webinars we have um, very sort of experienced CARA fellows with lots of teaching experience so you might be giving details of your teaching experience or if you've got less teaching experience you might be talking about related activities that demonstrate your potential to teach and something that I really wanted to highlight here is that your teaching experience outside the UK is absolutely valuable. I've spoken to a number of CARA fellows who've said to me, you know, does this count? You know, how is it viewed? And I think, again, it's about you making sure that you're saying, I've got a lot of teaching experience. Yes, it may have been gained in other parts of the world, but I've been teaching undergraduate students or master's students. I am um, really you know how to articulate um, my subject to students and get them to and help them learn and understand so that is valid wherever you've gained your teaching experience so lots of different types of teaching experience you can put in and again what you'll choose will de depend on how far you are in your career how much teaching experience you have and the type of job you're applying for so if you're applying for a lecturer you absolutely need to give quite a lot of detail of the teaching you've already have showing your ability but also your potential to engage and support learners. If you're applying for a postdoctoral position, then really you're probably not going to give a huge amount of detail on your teaching experience because they're more interested in your research, but you'll be letting them know you've done some teaching, uh, which will evidence your ability to communicate your research. Okay? Um, so uh, a whole range of different things you might talk about, lectures as well as tutorials, as well as you know, leading practical classes, supervising projects, whether you've been involved in, in delivering teaching or designing courses, those are differentiated and depending on the level of teaching job you're applying for, they'll want to see the progression and from someone who's who's delivered some teaching to somebody who's actually designed whole courses, whether you've been involved in developing assessments and giving feedback and a whole range of different things. You may want to talk about the teaching methods you've used, whether you've taught online as well as in person. And certainly, if you have a qualification to teach in higher education, that's becoming more common in the UK, more commonly asked for in the UK. Um, 
It does vary between universities what that qualification is, but most of the qualifications lead to something called um, Fellowship of the Higher Education Academy. We can pick that up at the end if anybody's interested in knowing more about that. But if you have some sort of qualification to teach in higher education, it is becoming more valuable for teaching roles in UK, whereas it never used to, to be. OK, here's a, a, another example. I'm not going to ask for your kind of opinions on this, but what I would say is this is probably from somebody who's fairly early on in their career. Um, they're talking about sort of tutoring and teaching assistant roles. Um, which is, is great, great experience to be building. One of the things I think they probably haven't done here is given us any sense of what level of teaching they're doing. Are they teaching first year undergraduate courses or honours courses? Are they teaching master's courses? So that's something that, that you should be doing. You should be differentiating. So when they're saying things like condensed matter physics, I'd want to know what level of course that was just so that the person reading knows what, what sort of level they're sort of teaching at. And as, as you progress your career, you're clearly um, so, you know, will be likely be building experience and teaching all kind of levels of students. So that's an example. It's it's an OK example of teaching, but it's not it's not sort of perfect by any means. There also tends to be other sort of sections on your CV as well as your research experience, and your teaching experience. There tends to be something on sort of professional service administration. And this is where you, you're providing evidence of um, the fact you're a good colleague, you've done other things, you've got involved in the broader academic community, um, and, and as a result, you're maybe building your kind of research profile or your profile as an academic, a lot of what Anne talked about a couple of weeks ago. So you might talk about things that you're involved in the peer review process, whether that for publications or for funding applications. You might be involved in editing, editing journals. You might be some strat industrial strategy advisory boards. And um, you might help organise conferences. You might be involved in more sort of research focused sort of admin type roles, such as you know organising licences or health and safety or so for experimental work. You might sit on a number of university committees or have sat in, in sort of previous job roles. So these are all things that, that indicate to the academic recruiter that you're somebody who's happy to get involved in other things, that you're not necessarily going to exclusively focus on your research and teaching without getting involved in the wider work of the department. So it's quite nice to, to put these things you know, in um, an academic CV. And you'll see some of them coming in here. This person's chosen to, to highlight them in, in different sections because they've got quite a lot of kind of um, academic related experience, I suppose. They're involved in sort of admissions uh, processes into a university and, and mentoring um, and widening access, um, encouraging uh, young people who don't traditionally go to universities to, to, to come. So a lot of activities there. But also they've talked about the different uh, committees or their members of. I would say that section at the bottom if you're talking about committees you're a member of, uh, you're a member of or have been a member of, sometimes it's quite nice to say a little bit about what your contribution was there. A simple list like this sometimes isn't terribly effective unless it's obvious from the, the, the title of your role in a committee and the, the, the actual committee that it's been something that you know the recruiter can see that, that you've had quite a lot of influence or impact. So do think about if you're going to put this on saying a little bit um, about um, the committees you've been a member of or what your contribution is. Yeah, and I uh, totally agree with the um, publications, not necessarily at the beginning, because they will look for publications in whatever um, spot they are in your CV. OK, we are um, quickly running out of time. And, I, you know, that was you know, a lot of information about academic CVs. Now, what I would like to say before I move on to supporting statements and cover letter is, is, is to pick up on, on some of the conversation we had right at the start is I haven't given you a template for an academy. I haven't shown you a full academic CV that I would say is a good academic CV. I have talked about what good headings might be. I've talked about what you need to emphasise in your CV. But it's really important to, to know that there isn't one good structure for an academic CV. Um, it depends on the job you're applying for and your specific experience. I would suggest that you have a look at a number of academic CVs. Ask colleagues, if you can, to show you their academic CV and think about what might work for you. Because it works for somebody else does not mean to say that the order they put their information in or what they emphasise in their CV is going to be right for you and what you're applying for. But you can certainly get ideas that way and then end up with an academic CV structured in the way that is best for you and the experience you're applying for. OK, happy to take more questions on that if you have any at the end, but let's sort of spend the last few minutes talking about 
the additional documents go alongside your, your academic CV in an application for an academic job, whether it's for a, a research role or teaching only or, or lecturer. So you're basically one of the things you cannot do in an academic CV and does not go on your academic CV is tell them why you want the job. OK, so your key information included either in a sporting statement or cover letter is why you want the job. Why are you interested in that specific job role and that particular university and department? OK, so this is where you, you really show them how enthusiastic and motivated you are. And this is where the research that you've done on the department, on the job, uh, on the university really comes into play, because you shouldn't be um, doing very generic information about this. It has to be something that demonstrates you've actually done your research. You do know something about the university, you know something about what was important to them, and you know something about the researchers or uh, teaching staff in the department. You don't need to mention specifics of the individuals in the department. But you need to talk about, you know, the, either the research and teaching and, and where you feel you sort of fit. And you're absolutely using your sporting statement or cover letter to highlight aspects of your experience that show very clearly how you meet um, the, the person specification that you've read in the job description. And this is quite tricky because um, I've said you should be targeting your CV to, to meet the job description. But I'm also going to say to you, you shouldn't be repeating your CV. So to when I'm giving feedback on CVs and, and, and supporting statements to cover letters, I like to see them both together because it might be you're looking at the CV and you go, well, yeah, that's not got enough information in it. But then you'll see the supporting statement. You go, OK, those go beautifully together. Um, or it could be that, um, that that you feel the CV is doing lots and you're repeating some of it in, in, the, in the letter. So you really need to get that balance right. So you're creating your CV and then you're thinking about, OK, how do I highlight uh, really relevant and interesting material and talk about it a little bit more detail in your in your um, cover letter or supporting statement. How long, I've said, how long should a cover letter or supporting statement be for an academic job? Some um, academic recruiters really help you out in this by, um, by letting you know how long they want it to be. They might tell you how many characters or how many uh, words or pages. If they don't, I think if you're applying for a, a lecturer role, you know, an open-ended lecturer role that's expected to come in and do research and teaching, then the sort of additional information you provide along your, alongside your academic CV is likely to be maybe a page and a half or so of A4, you know, you, maybe more even. You know, you, you will be providing them with quite a lot of detail because they're recruiting the kind of important role. Certainly, most cover letters are around a page of A4, but I think for a, an academic job where they're expecting, they're asking for a lot. I think it's fine to, to provide um, a little bit of longer, sort of more information, unless they've been specific um, in guiding you to how long they want it. And I've just said where to provide the information because that's what we'll do. You put it in your CV or do you put it in your cover letter? Um, OK, so a little bit more detail on this. But again, we've gone through a lot of it already. As appropriate to the role, depending on the job you're applying for, you'll be picking up here. So the cover, so the CV is a record of what you've already done, described in a way that meets the, the, the job description that you're applying for. But your cover letter supporting statement is then your ability to talk about what contribution you can make to what they're asking you to do. Not what you've already done, but what you can do. So you might say, I can teach which courses they already offer. You're going to teach, you could teach on. And again, your willingness to develop other courses, which we've already talked about. Again, if it's research, you might be talking about, um, you know, impact that's, that's coming up in research. So it might be publications that you're thinking about and going to yeah, um, submit um, that you can't actually put in your CV because they're kind of too early on. It, you might be talking about future research plans um, and maybe ideas for funding and who you might target for funding and ideas for collaboration. So this is where you're talking about what you're going to do in the future, but making sure it links directly to what they're asking you to do in the job. You know, but making sure you're you're using your CV or cover letter um, to highlight you know your future sort of contribution. Yeah, that's a really good point that Anne's just made there in the chat. Is that um, that if they are asking for you know th basic things like um, you know can you use Microsoft Office or um, I don't know in your in your uh, in the job description you don't necessarily need to to detail that on your um, supporting statement. So again, really highlighting what's most important. Uh, some places might ask for a bit more detail. 
in terms of um, they might ask for a research statement or a teaching statement and that's really what I mentioned in the the supporting statement or cover letter the research statement or teaching statement will tend to just be longer versions of this focused on either the research or the teaching so the research I've already sort of talked about some of these but you may just be giving much more detail about your research interests and where you intend to take that research in the future how you felt you've made an impact with your research Again, you know, highlighting your maybe your most important funding awards. You'll have mentioned them on your CV, but you may be highlighting them in your research statement. Um, definitely, as I said, those emerging research interests, maybe people you're talking to about potential collaborations. You might not mention the people if, if it's an early stage, but you might be saying, well, I'm thinking about collaborating with somebody else across the UK or um, France or wherever. Um, you will certainly be talking if you're applying for a lecture job, lecture or role that expects you to do research, that you have a strategy for, for bringing in funding to the university in the future, you know, how your research might attract funding. And REF, now this was mentioned right back on the first webinar by Sir Donald, the Rich Excellence Framework. So you may be talking about that and I'm happy to pick up on that if anybody doesn't know what that means. And again, for a teaching statement, sorry, I'm aware this is my um, almost last second last, second last slide. Um, for teaching statement, you'll be going into much more detail, as I said, about the levels you've taught, size of classes, your types of teaching, whether you've designed courses, designed assessments, that you've taught online, and also what your philosophy is in terms of teaching. How do you engage? What do you think works well in terms of engaging students? So they'll be asking for a lot more detail. So these are things that are really worth thinking about if they're asking, if they've got a real focus on, on teaching or research and they want a bit more information on that and either a cover letter, a supporting statement, or they ask for a specific statement on that. Okay, we're, we're pretty much there. I realise we're, we're at two, so this will just take me another sort of you know, 30 seconds or so. This was uh, somebody who did a PhD at the University of Edinburgh years ago now, moved on to assistant professor role at the University of Calgary after um, a few other roles, and I think has moved on since to, um, to another lecturer role, um, but I haven't kept up with them. And I think it's just getting across the fact that, you know, that you will develop your academic CV and then revise it and revise it and revise it. These will be small changes. You will not be making massive changes necessarily every time, but you will be what I call tweaking it, making small changes to make it look as, as positive as possible for the job you're applying. And get advice. I'm going to say that next. Um, but don't necessarily accept all suggestions because it is your application, but do take advice for others. And I'm just going to pick that up on the last slide really important to get feedback on your applications if at all possible. The sort of thing that Anne and I do as, as careers consultants, we're very happy to give feedback on academic applications. We tend not to be experts in your research area or your teaching area, but I think we're fairly confident. We, we know what makes a good academic application. So if you have access to careers advisor in your institution and you're applying for academic jobs of any sort, do ask them for, for feedback or get another academic member of staff, either your manager or a colleague, your principal investigator, your PhD supervisor, ask for feedback from them. Um, really worth doing. I can't stress enough how useful it is to get feedback. There's a few um, websites there that, um, that have some further advice, some examples. Um, I think uh, jobs.ac.uk um, actually has CV templates, which I've already said we kind of advise against using, but take ideas from them, you know, take ideas that work for you from them. Uh, and I'm sure um, Anne has a uh, sort of information on uh, sort of academic uh, CVs and applications on her website as well. I should have said right at the start that uh, this is being recorded and uh, Carol will make it available to you and I will also send them the slides so that uh, you have access to these slides as well. Okay, I'm aware we're already two um, minutes over. I'm sorry for keeping you a bit longer. I'm very um, happy to, to hang around for a little while and take any further questions that come up in the chat box. I hope you found that useful. Um, it, it's hard, you, you know, to not be able to give you examples, but I think it, it doesn't necessarily work sort of well for you. So I'm going to stop the recording now, but I'm going to stay here um, and um, 